All right, so here are some things that are irrefutable. Doesn't matter who you are, they are irrefutable. We all have 168 hours in our week and we have 24 hours in our day. Now, there might be different concerns or needs that impinge themselves or, or impose themselves upon our hours, but we all have the same amount of time. So the question is, what do we do with that time? Like, like where does it go? Like, what happens to it? I know this is probably a question you've asked yourself at the end of a day or at the end of a week. What happened to the time? But maybe even a more specific question for our purposes today is like, what does it mean to be generous with our time? What does it mean to be generous with our time? This is the name of the teaching series, Generous. And we're looking at like the three core resources that all of us have at varying degrees, time, treasure, and talent. And we're asking the question, like, what does it look like for us to have the marks of being connected and in relationship with a generous God? And for that generous God, that relationship with that generous God to show up in how we use all of these resources. And throughout this series, this three-week series, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 as it is like one of the hallmark passages on generosity. Now, admittedly, it's speaking to financial generosity for a specific situation, but we're going to be expanding that, extrapolating out and saying, okay, here's some principles about generosity that we can apply beyond finances, though we'll be talking about that, but to time and to our talents as well. So before we go up into 2 Corinthians, I want to spend some time talking about Paul's relationship, who is the author, uh, and to, with the Corinthians. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, he says that the first time he came into Corinth to talk to people about Jesus, he came like with like, you know, anxiety, with, with he was kept on catching his breath. He was nervous. He says he didn't come in with fine sounding arguments or eloquence. So he had like this, like uh, this, you know, maybe a little bit of a low grade panic attack when he was talking to people about the gospel in the city of Corinth for the first time. In fact, he was met with antagonism and challenges in this city. The city of Corinth in that day was like, if you can imagine if you're living in Tacoma, like think 6th Ave before COVID at 1 a.m. on a Friday night, that was a little glimpse of COVID, but you throw, sorry, a little glimpse of Corinth, but you throw in some paganism and a little frat house and that like more fully develops the picture out. That is Corinth, 6th Ave on a Friday night with, with a little bit of paganism or maybe a lot of, of paganism and a little bit of frat house. That's a picture of Corinth. And here Paul is coming into this city to tell them that there is one who loves them that has overcome sin and is inviting them to repent and live to the full of life that God has planned for them. Wow, I can imagine how that could cause a little bit of anxiety. I mean, just imagine going to 6th Ave and proclaiming that message to any and all that might hear a little bit of timidity in the voice. But Paul says, even though I didn't come with fine sounding arguments and eloquence, even though I had some kind of anxiety, I did come with the power of God. And so he saw the power of God move and there was a church that was formed. And after he left, the church started going back to its old ways. Um, and Paul wrote a letter uh, that he, in his second letter to the Corinthians, he refers to uh, as his tearful letter, the first Corinthians, the letter to the, the first letter to the Corinthians. It was a tearful letter of challenge and provocation. And why have you departed from the faith? Why have you? Uh, why, why are you doing this in regards to, you know, your, 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 uh, your, your finances? Why are you suing each other? Why are you not caring for the poor? Why are you living in such a way with, you know, within your, in, in your area of sexuality? What, like, what's happening? Why are you doing this? In the second Corinthians, the letter that we're reading from today is kind of like this beautiful, like, kind of response to the first letter. He sees, Paul knows, he hears about how the Corinthians getting that first letter respond with uh, repentance and like a deeper pursuit of Jesus. And so 2 Corinthians is, is a lot of like honesty in Paul's part, poignancy, comfort, vulnerability, and tenderness. And that frames a lot of this letter. It'd be helpful for our, us as we go through these three weeks to understand the letter. And so you might even wanna read through the whole letter in the next week or so. It's a beautiful, beautiful letter. So we pick up um, 
Paul's letter to the second Corinthians in chapter nine, verses, verses 12 to 15. And in this section specifically, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about how like they can be generous to bless people that are in a terrible, challenging situation in Jerusalem. They're experiencing famine and, and, and they need relief. They need provision. They need food. They need care. And the Corinthians in a much better spot, not experiencing famine and having resources. Paul is saying you can leverage, you can use what you have to bless those that do not have. That frames what he's talking about and the, and the encouragement towards generosity that he's offering. So in verse 12, he says, This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. This is what he's saying. He's like, the, the care you're offering the people suffering from famine in Jerusalem is, is overflowing in expressions of thanks to God and meeting the needs of people. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them, with everyone and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Okay, I want to zero in. I want to microscope in on verse 13 there, where it says, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the generosity of sharing with them and everyone else. Paul is saying there, he's, he's saying, you've proved yourselves. How have you proved yourself? You've proved, your, proved yourselves that you have a deep connection and a deep understanding of who God is. Your, your actions are demonstrating that you know God, he could say. Uh, and... He goes on to say, for the obedience, which is the same thing, the obedience is the same thing that's it's demonstrated that they know the generosity of God, that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. What, what is like Paul saying here? In very succinct, un, like readily understandable language, Paul is saying, your generosity is a mark of you knowing the generous God. Because you know the generosity of God, it has allowed you to be generous with the people suffering famine in Jerusalem. Paul is saying that, Paul is saying that because you know that God became poor in Jesus so that you might become rich because that message has a affected your hearts, it has worked its way not only into your hearts, but is motivating how you use your finances. The message of God's generosity has so impacted you, it is, is brought, it's not just a spiritual truth, but it's manifesting in your everyday life. That's what Paul's saying. And he's praising God for this reality in the Corinthians' life. <clears throat> so this is this principle that is important for us to understand at the front end before we talk about time today. The 168 hours in a week, the 24 hours that we have. Before we talk about this incredibly valuable resource, it's important for us to understand the mark of generosity. For Paul, generosity comes from understanding the generosity of God. Understanding the generosity of God causes us to be generous. We are generous when we understand that God was first generous with us. And in fact, oftentimes, Generosity disconnected uh, from the generosity of God becomes either guilt motivated or superficial charity without really an internal generous heart. Paul is saying deep, deep, deep generosity comes from knowing the generosity of God. Okay, so we're going to look at this, this concept of time, or not this concept, this reality of time that all of us deal with, all of us have, all of us have to reckon with. We're going to be looking at like three different blocks where we spend time or should spend time. Think about it like a budget. You know, we have, if you have a budget, hopefully you do. We'll be talking about that next week. Wait for it. But if you have a budget, you have these different lines that take up different amounts of your money. And so we're going to be look using uh, that same principle with time. You could think about it maybe like a time audit. Have you ever, have you ever used a time audit where you're looking at how you spend your time? So the first big block of time is rest. Time 
for rest. Did you know that most of us spend about a third of our life sleeping? A third of our life sleeping. If you compare it to a budget, sleep is like the mortgage, right? It's Or the rent payment. It's not necessarily like very cool, you know? It's not like a vacation necessarily, though like sometimes it feels like it, right? But it's necessary. Necessary, but not that interesting, sleep. But to think about this. Like God has created you in a way where you need sleep. Like God could have created us in a way where we did not need sleep, but God created us in a way that we are dependent upon sleep. In fact, sleep existed, we can look at before sin entered the world. So sleep isn't something that it happens because of the world's brokenness, but it's something that is part of the goodness of God's creation. Sleep and rest. Every young parent of young kids knows the necessity of sleep. But, but beyond just sleep in general, like expanding beyond sleep, like rest, it's principle of rest, which is the overarching theme, you know, that sleep is a subset of rest. Rest is uh, an important block of how we should see, how we should need to spend our time. This is like not just like a suggestion, but a command, right? As uh, in Exodus, uh, in the first presentation of the Ten Commandments, uh, Moses records this principle, this command of rest that we should Sabbath. And in Exodus, he talks about the, our rest as like participating in the rhythm of God and the rhythm of creation. Just as God rested on the seventh day, so we too rest. This is part of who we are. And to not live into this rhythm means, means we're living out of rhythm. We need to integrate in how we spend our time integrating rest in there. It's interesting, the second presentation of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15, talks about not rest as a, the command of rhythm, but rest as this command of rest in light of resistance. Just as you were under slavery in Egypt, now you are not, so rest. In fact, employ and offer that rest to those that are under your care. So rest from a biblical perspective is a mix of rhythm that we're participating in the rhythms of our createdness and the, the rhythms that God shows us and, and demonstrates for us and, and has he rests on the seventh day. And then also it's a part of making provision for others and, and, and thinking of others and a mark of really a just society. Can you rest? Are you allowing time for rest. And Jesus says famously that the Sabbath was not created for man, but man was, or the, that man was not created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was created for man. So it's Jesus, rather than doing away with the Sabbath, he's saying, no, it's a good thing. That is to bless people. Rest. Sabbath, the word in Hebrew just means cease, to stop. Like, I just want to say, as we think about being generous, as we think about how we use our resources, it's important to know that, that like resting is something that all of us should be integrating on various levels into our use of our time, our 168 hours a week, our 24 hours a day. And here's, here's the, um, something that is important for us to understand our ability to rest is dependent on our vision of God. Our ability to rest is dependent on our vision of God. So if we have a, a vision of God that's tyrannical and mean, it becomes an, very hard to imagine resting. Similarly, if we have a guilt-laden religious God where we're done, we have to do, 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 do and to, to, to get in God's favor. If that's our vision of God, it's going to be very hard to imagine resting as a possibility. If I was to be honest, in my, in my own transparency, resting has been very hard for me. Early on in uh, our church planning experience, my wife told me, Brian, Brian, we can plant a church, but and maybe you've heard this before, but we can plant a church, but we need to have a Sabbath. 
We need to have a regular family night. And we need to have a date night where we eat some yummy food, we drink some good wine, and just enjoy each other's company. And what she was saying is, essentially, we can plan a church, but you can't be a workaholic. We can't be going on this rhythm that is unsustainable. We need to have rest integrated into our life, integrated into our family. And one of the journeys for me was becoming more familiar with the generosity of God. Because when you are familiar with the generosity of God, when you're familiar with the gospel, you can rest. You can finally rest. Why? <laughs> because Jesus says it is finished, which means it's not all up to you. Which means that there has been something significant accomplished that you can't do, but you sometimes just to get to relax into it. It means you can rest. The fact that God is generous and he's sovereign means that there are things that are, are, can be done when you aren't doing them. The fact that God is generous means that we're pre-loved. We're loved before we do something. Therefore, we can rest because we're already loved. These are marks of just simply knowing God. So the question I would ask you is like, are you familiar with that God that permits you to rest? Have you been marked by the generosity of God and does it, has it shown up on your calendar with rest? The cool thing is that when it shows up on your calendar, when you've been marked by the generosity of God, you become generous with yourself as I've described. You know, I, I think that we should be generous with ourselves because God is generous to us, so we should be generous with ourselves. This doesn't mean lavish or indulgent, but it means that we should take note from God. He's generous to us. We should be generous with ourselves. But also that spills then out. And actually the true mark of meeting the generosity of God spills out into how we interact with others. If you are in a leadership position, it means you create intentional times of rest for people that are under your leadership and your care. Because you've been marked by the generosity of God, you extend that out towards being generous with others. It means with family and friends, you're, you're marked by the generosity of God internally. You're generous with yourself, so now you are generous with others. You don't expect your family and friends to be at your beck and call all the time. You don't expect them to call back ASAP, text back ASAP. You don't insecurely think there's a problem with your relationship if they don't instantly call back. Why? Because you're leaving margin. You're leaving space for them to rest and you're assuming the best. This is all a part of being marked by the generosity of God when it comes to rest. The next thing, um, like on the time budget, as you could say, would be time for relationships. Like, and yeah, we'll get to what it looks like for to be marked for those relationships to be marked by generosity, but it's important to know a couple things here. Like for instance, like, us, on average, as a recent study describes, uh, all of us, we spend about 39 minutes a day socializing. 39 minutes. Now, we also spend about 4.2 hours a day using apps. Think about that. Think about ju that, just what that says to our relationship, about our relationships. 39 minutes a day socializing, 4.2 hours a day using apps. And admittedly, some of those 39 minutes are probably while we're also using apps, right? But you contrast that with the fact that it takes 40 to 60 hours to form a casual friendship, and then 80 to 100 hours to become a friend, and 200 hours to become a good friend. It means this. If you do the math, it'll show you. It takes two months just to become a casual friend, right? Which is tragic to hear when I say, yeah, I just don't think I could spend time with them. I don't think they're my type of people. Uh, when it's, the studies show that you just need to actually spend two months before you can actually have an honest assessment of that. Especially in our culture marked by tribalism where we're quickly discounting somebody because of a, a rogue or flippant comment that they say. It takes two months to even become a casual friend. 
think about this with, with pastoral ministry in mind. So admittedly, this is kind of a, something that is more relevant to me, but just I think it will be able to broaden the application in a second. Thinking about this with pastoral ministry in mind, friendships can be very tricky things. It can be tempting to use my time to curate an image or to cultivate acquaintances, but never make and create deep friends. And there's a thousand reasons for it, but the results are telling in the newspapers. Another story, another failure, another fall of a pastor that didn't have close friends, didn't have close relationships. And I th here's the broadening out of the application is that this is really just all of our story. Without a friend that can lean in and lovingly challenge or ask intentional questions without putting our time in that particular area, in a very pragmatic way, we're leaving ourselves open to all the terrible, toxic things that happens when we are unknown. Probably some of my best friends um, are a couple um, that I initially didn't think would be friends. I was leading years and years ago in another town, this group for young married couples. And uh, we had one couple come over to Candace and I's house and they stayed well past everyone else. And Candace and I occasionally looked at each other like, oh, should we kick them out? And uh, we didn't. Um, we played some board games. We had some, uh, some laughs. And this, uh, this the guy uh, is actually, he's. if you watch Ted Lasso, there's this Dutch character who will always say these things that are seemingly just like terrible, but he doesn't mean them to be. He's like, uh, you aren't very smart, are you? You know, say things like that. And he's like, he doesn't mean them to be. And like the guy that is one of my closest friends is like that type of person. In fact, he's also Dutch, go figure. Uh, and so like on the front of it, it would be very easy to kind of have this kind of like bristling reaction. But what I found is after time spent together, after like, you know, like that initial time and then the following times after it, like this is a person that became one of the closest people in my life. What was the difference? Yes. What, what, what made the difference? Yes, there's, there's, there's things that we had in common, but the main difference was time spent together. Jesus is an example of this, right? You know, because he had his 12 uh, that he spent lots of time with. He had the three that he spent more time with. And I think it's maybe important to say like, and I don't know, maybe this sounds sacrilegious, but I think Jesus had it easier, frankly. Um, you know, it didn't have cars or freeways or, or phones or uh, any of that. It was just people. It became easier to spend hours with each other. We have created a system that feels overwhelming and is frankly not friendly to friendship. But when we're marked by the generosity of God, when we're marked by the generosity of God, we start to use our time to form meaningful friendships. Why? Well, the generosity of God succinctly expressed is that, you know, like that Christ took all of our sin on himself and that willingly did it as a, as a plan hatched to bring reconciliation between God's image bearers and God's self. This is the picture of the generosity of God. And what does that mean? It means that I'm fully known and I have nothing to hide before God because he knows it all and he's paid the full price for it. And so when we're marked by that, that message, the generosity of God expressed as I just said, we can feel free to be vulnerable with another person. And in that vulnerability, intentionally so, not flippantly vulnerable, not kind of like willy nilly, you know, not here's my dirty clothes, aren't I terrible? Not this kind of like, not a flippant vulnerability, but an intentional vulnerability. And when we are intentionally vulnerable with another person, friendships always form. 
How do I become vulnerable? It's, 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 do you, are, have you been marked by the generosity of God? Do you know that you're already known so you have nothing to hide? And if you are, then you can be confidently and intentionally vulnerable with people. That's just a, simply a mark, yes, of emotional health, but really more deeply of knowing the generosity of God on a soul level, on a relational level. And then also, we can offer the generosity we ourselves have received to others when they don't perform like the perfect people we wish they were, which is a part of friendship. So like, think about this then. If we're marked by the generosity of God, we use our time towards the ends, you know, that are, that are really important for us, important for others. Rest, friendships. We reject the use of time for things that are, are meaningless. We're trying to spend our time on things that are significant. And third, time for serving. You know, Deuteronomy 15, 11 uh, says, there will always be the poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. And then Matthew 20, 28 says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Like it's all throughout the Bible. There's, there's like no, you can't make an argument that like scripture doesn't speak about service as essential for the followers of Jesus. It is very, very clear. If we're thinking about how we spend our time, Jesus' followers are those that serve. We spend our time serving. There is not an argument to the contrary. If you are a Jesus follower and you're not serving, that just means a part of your, you're not, you're not following Jesus in a part of your life. That's just, that's what it means. The Greek word there in Matthew for serve is diakonos, which means a house servant. So, so Jesus himself is saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve. He's saying in the Father's house of creation, I am like a servant. I am here to bless. I am here to meet the needs of those in need. I am here for those that need. And this is the way of Jesus, right? That we would be like a house servant in the Father's house, moving towards those with needs. This is in contrast to what is often marketed of the person at the top, enjoying the spoils of those that have provided it for them and the various structures of pyramid schemes that are on offer where one person at the top enjoy, enjoys the spoils of those that provide from underneath. Jesus flips the pyramid and says, I am here to serve and to bless up, to bless those ab and, and around me and to offer myself to those around me. You know, it's interesting because I, as I mentioned, it's, this is in contrast to the message of culture, but while in contrast to the message of culture, the idea of serving, it is actually in alignment with our creation, with, with how God has created us. In fact, like people that are regularly serving um, have up to 44% less mortality rate. You know, like it's like there's, this, there's a study after study that show that serving creates actual bodily health. It's because like it's how God has created us. Go figure. If we live in alignment with how God has created us, our bodies respond to that. Right? This is significant. Um, and I think that this is important for us to hear. And this isn't necessarily speaking to the anchor community, but just larger. Like I think over the last two years, we started out celebrating lots of serve, serve. Oh, look at this is great happening here. And, but I think we really have since gone into ourselves. And we're really have kind of went deep into ourselves and is expressed through the tribalism and the partisanship, but really just expressing this kind of this deep inwardness and service brings us out of that. To serve brings us out of the, in, the unhealthy inwardness where we're right in front of another person and their need. It's important to note that many in the past have served out of guilt 
thinking that they could either, uh, they, either guilt has a motivation or I need to get in God's favor or in favor of, in favor of someone else by serving. And this isn't the mark of being, this isn't like, that's, that's not marked by a generous God. When you're marked by the a generous God, uh, the, the generosity expressed in the gospel, what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians, you know how God has poured himself out for you. And so you, in the context of rest, and deep relationships also pour yourself out for others. This could look like um, just joining a serve team at Anchor where you're serving. It could look like blessing your neighborhood. In fact, if you have a vision for how you could love your neighbor as well in your neighborhood, we would love to hear about it and, and even resource it. It could look like a variety of things, but it but it always could be described as serving when acted out. <laughs> Years ago when I was uh, leading an internship, we did this exercise. We called it the eulogy exercise, where um, we would have all of the interns imagine uh, that it was the end. It's, it was the end. It was their memorial service and their closest companions, their spouse, a close friend, a brother or a sister were all giving eulogies. And they would write the eulogies that they wished would be read aloud at their memorial service. <laughs> it may sound morbid to you, but it was a profound, profound exercise. In writing these eulogies of their spouse, a brother or a sister or a close friend, they always found something. To put it succinctly, they found how they really wanted to spend their time. Imagine their brother saying this, their sister saying that, their spouse saying this, their spouse saying that, their close friend saying this, or close friend saying that. And they always came out with a life plan of how to spend their time. Uh, and it was always along the lines of he or she loved well and he or she served well. He or she was marked by generosity. And here's the, here's the good news, though. Wherever you're at in your life, if you're 70 and looking back on a life where you're like, oh, I wish generosity was more evident earlier on, or if you're 30 and you don't quite know how to like, live in a way that's marked by generosity, you haven't made that connection between that powerful spiritual truth and how you're living with your calendar, wherever you're at, there is always a time to start and the time to start is today. It may look like this, catching a renewed glimpse of the generosity of God. God, would you help me understand your generosity to me, not just on an intellectual level, but on a real deep spiritual level. It may be walking out in faith, believing that you know the truth, and then expressing it in service, or expressing it in rest, expressing it in deep relationships, uh, you'll see it show up. Wherever you're at, today is the day to start using your time in a way that reflects the generosity of God.